Josh. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to present here today. Um, so I was asked to talk about moving T1 to the aortic arch, and this is a little bit of a broad topic. The goal here is not to give specifics so much as to give the audience a little bit of a broad sense of where the field is, how it's evolving, and how we're managing some of these problems. Uh, a couple of disclosures uh, for consultation that I do that is peripherally or somewhat related to the topic. I think uh, for some members of the audience, it's important to understand why uh, we as physicians are, are dealing with this problem at all. Thoracic aortic pathology breaks down into basically degenerative disease and, dis and dissection disease. We don't deal too much with occlusive disease in the arch and the proximal aorta. But this is a real problem. So the best numbers we can come up with is that somewhere around 3 to 5% of people over the age of 65 are going to have degenerative, degenerative thoracic aneurysms with the rapidly aging population, that's a significant number. It will continue to be a significant problem that all of us face, both in, the, both in the community practice as well as in the academic practice. And while all of us dream of the mid-descending thoracic aneurysm with the apple and a stick with five centimeter landing zones on both sides, that's unfortunately the rarity. Most of these uh, patients will have the majority will have ascending or arch aneurysms. It's about 70% of all thoracic aneurysms. And after that, if you add on the people who have technically a descending aneurysm but with a marginal or unsuitable proximal landing zone, you're talking about a lot of patients who are going to have this problem in the next upcoming decades. <clears throat> in addition to dealing with aneurysms themselves, there's another significant problem, which is that of thoracic dissection. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time here because outside of I think there's uh, some element of, of maybe confusion or misinformation amongst non-cardiac surgeons about what exactly happens when a thoracic dissection presents and it's not a type B. So again, while we would all wish that the dissections are here in this category, 3B dissections, and I think as a field, we've made some reasonable progress in managing type 3Bs endovascularly, uh, really to date, the majority of, of work in dealing with more proximal dissections has been with open cardiac surgical techniques, and that's still, I would say, uh, a little bit of a strong phrase, but probably still the standard of care, at least in this country. So obviously you see a pathological specimen with true and false lumen, it gives you an idea of how complicated this problem really is. But the real issue is that of all the thoracic dissections that we see, and there's a significant number of these cases, the majority are actually type A or proximal dissections. That's something that I think we tend to forget, particularly in the vascular side of things, because what we're dealing with mainly are, are more descending dissections. So the majority of these dissections, two-thirds of them, are going to be type A dissections that get managed surgically. And you think, well, great, that problem is solved, but really it's not solved at all, because the way these dissections are repaired is shown here in this cartoon. And I think this is important. What you see here are the multiple ways that uh, proximal, both aneurysms, and more importantly for this talk, dissections are managed. And what you'll see here is that in an emergency situation, when you have a proximal dissection, the cardiac surgeons with open surgical techniques are repairing the ascending aorta, plus minus the valve, which you won't get into. But the dissection still remains in the arch and then down the descending aorta. The phrase hemiarch is used a lot, and I'm actually surprised that very few people know what a hemiarch actually is. So we throw that phrase around, but here's a cartoon. Some sometimes will be dictated as a hemiarch, but it's really just an ascending and stop short of the innominate. A true hemiarch will go to the level of the left subclavian. The inferior wall will be replaced by graft, but it's a hemiarch because the dissection flap is still present here in this location, as is shown in this cartoon. Although there's an attempt to bring the two lumens together and sew them together in a large, large number of cases, that false lumen is still perfused in the thoracic arch. And that's the problem. Unless you do a total arch of some variety like this, or do a total arch with a frozen elephant trunk, this portion of the aorta, the descending and more importantly the arch, is still dissected and can become aneurysmal and have persistent flow. That's the problem that all of us are going to have to deal with as these patients are living longer and doing better after their open repair of type A dissections. They're presenting years later. Now they're older, they're sicker, and they have a problem dealing with perfusion to the brain that we don't really have a great solution for. So currently, 
in areas where total endovascular solutions are not available, we've been trying to deal with this by using some hybrid type approaches. And I'll take you through one or two cases that we did uh, that, that used a hybrid type approach. Again, the cartoon will show you in, 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 what we're trying to do is to basically essentially debranch the cerebral vessels off the ascending aorta and then use the multi-branch uh, graft, the open graft that we sew in, use the branch that's remaining and deliver a stent graft through that to help treat, uh, to treat this portion of the aorta which is dissected in aneurysmal. It has some advantages over a total redo in the sense that you can eliminate circulatory arrest, so that's a huge advantage for the patient. You can minimize or reduce uh, cardiopulmonary bypass time, which is obviously an advantage. And uh, there is an advantage in terms of overall morbidity and mortality compared to a total arch replacement when you use a hybrid endovascular technique. So how does this work? Uh, we will typically cannulate the right axillary artery to provide cerebral perfusion while we're doing the case. It does require a sternotomy, obviously, to sew in the open graft with a deep branch. Uh, you can have the heart can, can remain beating while we're doing this, which is, again, advantageous for a, a variety of reasons in terms of perfusing both the brain and the distal body. We do the uh, proximal anastomosis, uh, deep branch, and then uh, we separate from cardiopulmonary bypass and do the endovascular portion of the case. This is the case that we did, and you can see it looks pretty similar to the, uh, the diagram that I showed. Here are the three branches that go to that go to the great vessels, the innominate, the left carotid, and the uh, left subclavian. Those are all usually accessible from the sternotomy site. And then the fourth limb is going to be used to deliver the endograft. You actually have to be a little bit careful that you don't deliver the endograft too proximally and cover the anastomosis that you just created, which is a little trickier than you would imagine. So we typically will put some metal clips or and so on um, to mark where that anastomosis is. Uh, a couple of challenges here technically because you're doing everything backwards. So the nose cone is going in the incorrect direction. The stent grafts are all designed to be delivered from the femoral, so the delivery lengths are very long. Uh, managing the wire, setting up the table, setting up the room all has to be changed because everything is backwards and, and so it's a lot of coordination between uh, nursing, the tax, uh, and the physicians themselves. So we deliver the, the, the graph like this and then you can see here this is what the angio will look like and again you have to be very careful that you don't cover the deep branch and astomosa that you've just uh, spent you know some time creating. And here we are uh, opening the stent graft. Obviously, we're going to use a bridging stent graft here to connect these two pieces to each other once we've done, once we finish deploying uh, this piece. And then I think uh, doing ballooning the proximal. And here's our completion. So that looks pretty good, but this is, you know, a huge effort. It, ultimately requires uh, both the cardiac surgeons and, and the vascular surgeons in our case, or multiple teams working together, whatever the specialties may be. Uh, you still have cardiopulmonary bypass involved, and uh, it, it's, 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 it's a major procedure for the patient. Oftentimes, uh, obviously, this is a reduced sternotomy, which in and of itself has its own issues. So while it's a solution, it's not a simple or an easy solution is probably the best way to put it. <clears throat> Transapical TVAR is something that we've also done. Again, trying to get around the issues of reduced sternotomy. Uh, this is a patient who had a pseudoaneurysm. We had a very compl complicated previous cardiac and thoracic surgical history with lung transplantation, and they had a pseudoaneurysm. And again, this is technically not the arch, but it kind of uh, gives you a sense of the different ways that we're trying to, to, to solve some of these problems. We had to modify the stent graft because it was too long. They do have some IDE applications now for shorter ascending grafts that are uh, available here in the United States and obviously outside the United States. And what you'll see here is that uh, anytime we get to the ascending aorta, we uh, typically go into rapid ventricular pacing, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But you can see the pseudoaneurysm here. And uh, again, where the graft gets, uh, this is the, deployment, the video of the, the graft itself being deployed multiple issues in terms of transapical access. You have to work fairly rapidly. The, 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 that transapical access will start bleeding after you know, a certain period of time. And so you have to move rapidly, modify the graft, dealing with nose cone issues, delivery length issues, but it is doable. 
And so uh, here's the completion angio, and here's the uh, CT scan from the pre and post. Uh, again, complicated, not easy, but doable with the technology that we have. So where are we now with total endovascular solutions? Again, without getting into the nitty gritties, I'm trying to give everyone a sense of the various approaches that are being taken. And so I've grouped these into what I call the single branchers, uh, the multi-branchers, and then the others. So single branchers, and this is not meant to be exhaustive, there actually are new core companies coming out uh, all the time. Uh, this is a very rapidly evolving field, but Gore and Medtronic both have a single branch approach to this. Uh, these are both in trials now. We'll get to some of the data. Uh, slight differences in the construction. The, the Medtronic graft has the little volcano or kind of nipple-like uh, protrusion that you can see here uh, where the bridging stent goes in. Uh, the Gore tag uh, does not have that particular aspect. Uh, the, some of the advantage of the Gore graft is that we're all familiar with that technology and that platform. There's nothing custom made. It's off the shelf, so that's a huge advantage. It only requires femoral access, another big advantage compared to some of the other uh, devices that we'll see. And uh, everything becomes it comes pre-cannulated, and most of the, of the devices for the arch have that advantage. Uh, you can see a little bit of a blow up of some of the components and what this looks like. Uh, there are some ceiling stents proximally and distally. There's very minimal amount of bare metal that's present, and you can see the pre-cannulated wire there. Regardless of which brand or which type of, of uh, single branch graft you use, you're going to have to manage the cerebral vessels with some type of open surgical procedure. If you're going to the left subclavian, all is well in zone two, but once you get to zone one, you're all automatically into a carotid subclavian bypass or transposition for elective cases uh, for almost everybody. And certainly if you start going more proximal than that, you're going to have to do a carotid, carotid, carotid subclavian bypass and that's shown here for those of you not familiar with this. You're taking inflow from the right carotid artery, going to the left carotid artery, and that same graft goes over to the left subclavian, typically is how most of us do it. Uh, so there is, again, in a sense, the single branch grafts or, or hybrid graft in that there is some open surgical revascularization, extra anatomic revascularization required if you're going to go more proximal in the arch. Uh, so preliminary or initial data from some of these, uh, for, from the single branch, the data is coming out all the time. Here's what's published. Uh, this was the uh, 31 patients were in, enrolled in the, zone, in the feasibility study for zone two, and then nine, and maybe a few more than that are now in the zone zero for the Gore graft. Uh, the pivotal trial has begun, and you can see initially one of the problems uh, that, that you were seeing is, is uh, paraparesis, uh, there have also been some axicide complications and then uh, cerebrovascular accidents are something that plague all devices and all approaches in the arch and the ascending aorta. Uh, the uh, Medtronic graft also has gone through feasibility. Uh, they have 15 patients and I think it's a few more than that they are currently enrolled. And again, what you can see on here in the list of complications is that uh, minor strokes, and I would argue there's really almost nothing like a minor stroke, but that's been the bugaboo again as you're manipulating large sheaths and grafts and wires in the arch and old patients who have a lot of disease. The multi-branchers. So there are a lot of multi-branchers. Cook has a multi-brancher in the sense that there are internal branches with external fenestrations, which I'll show you a, a picture of in a second. Bolton has a multi-branch graft, and again, you can see here from internally, there are internal branches that come out through a combined portal, which you see here, that allows you to cannulate uh, and then put your bridging stents in. Uh, Nexus is a, a company out of Israel that has, uh, on this depiction, it's a single branch, but they have a multi-branch uh, version as well. And that's a little bit of a, of a different approach to doing this, which we'll talk about in a second. And then there's a Japanese graft, uh, the Najuda graft, that also has multiple branches that are available. Uh, this is the endospan device, which is a slightly different approach. So I, I thought I'd spend a little bit of time talking about it. There's a branch that comes here. You need axillary access from the right side. And this piece goes in first, and then the bridging piece of the ascending comes second. So it allows, to allows you to have continuous perfusion of the cerebral vessels while the graft is being deployed. So in other words, the, you don't go from proximal to distal. You put the distal piece in first and then interlock the proximal piece in the ascending aorta 
with overlap from here to here, so you get several centimeters of overlap. Uh, here's the Cook graph, a little more detail. There's probably more data about this graph than any of the others. You can see the internal branches, uh, and you can use the fluency or bi-bond as your, uh, as your, as your, as your bridging stents. I'm going to take you through one case of this. This ended up being uh, a neat case. This is actually a patient of mine who I had seen when I was at Emory University. And, and uh, you can see here the patient has essentially a pectus, and there was a significant concern for doing a sternotomy in this patient, which would have been a reduced sternotomy. And you can see right here the vessels are very close to the sternum itself. And uh, in addition, he has a very large aneurysm. Again, this is a residual from a type A. He would, lived in North Georgia, was told that there was nothing available to him at all because he was 80 years old and no one wanted to do a reduced anatomy. I ended up seeing the patient. We went back and forth. I ended up calling Matt Eagleton at the Cleveland Clinic. We had the patient go up there. And so these uh, actual intraoperative pictures are courtesy of Matt. Uh, and we, it was nice to be able to work with him to, do, to get this patient taken care of. The patient's doing very well. Uh, so here is another view of the CAT scan itself. Uh, this patient ended up getting a carotid pavement bypass with two uh, branch endograft, and uh, here's the fusion image, and you can see on the uh, on the fusion, the on the white, the outlines of where the great vessels are, and cannulating through the innominate. Uh, you'll see in the top, just like we did for the ascending, there's rapid ventricular pacing, which is starting right now as the graft is being deployed. We certainly think that doing rapid ventricular pacing was something to uh, reduce blood pressure and heart rate while you're deploying in the ascending in the arch is almost mandatory at this stage anyway. I think none of the delivery systems are quite good enough to give you precise deployment without doing that. Or I should say we're more comfortable with that, for lack of a better word. And uh, you see your cannulation with both branches, uh, and obviously in a retrograde fashion. Here's a completion uh, CT scan, and you can see both branches are functioning quite well. The patient obviously has a distal uh, dissection with aneurysm degeneration, which will have to be dealt with. But amazingly enough, our fields progress to the point where that becomes the easy part of the case, where you can imagine several years ago that in, in and of itself would have been daunting. So now I think I, I'm not sure whether I'm going to do it or Matt's going to do it, but we're going to finish uh, uh, distally by debranching uh, and then fenestrating into his visceral segment. And, Uh, the results in the multi-branch you can see on uh, the peach-colored screen is from the uh, it's from the Cook trial. Group one and group two are separated by early versus late experience, and it's pretty easy to guess which one is the later experience. As you get uh, uh, more experience, your complication rate goes down, endo leaks go down, uh, secondary procedures, and most importantly, the strokes go down. But you can still see the stroke percent. The stroke rate is above 10 percent even even with this approach. Uh, and then on the uh, the blue screen is the uh, handful of patients that have been done with the nexus graft. And again, you can see they're having significant issues with cerebrovascular accidents, uh, even with that approach. Uh, the Najuta graft has about 30 patients in the last published data. I do not personally know what their total number is at this point. They had a lower stroke rate, but they had a higher rate of retrograde type A dissections. Uh, and so again, you're, you're seeing that this is not an easy area to work in. And I put this graph up because this is a depiction of aortic calcification broken down by age in different zones of the aorta. And the take home message here is that where we're working here and here, and the patient population that we're dealing with, which is the dark blue, the degree of aortic calcification and disease is significant. So that's going to be a major issue as we move forward. Uh, finally, I'll end by talking about the snorkelers. Uh, the snorkelers are ever-present, whether you're talking about the abdominal aorta or the thoracic aorta. Uh, this is a multi-center registry out of Europe. They have 95 cases. Josh is laughing. I know he has nightmares about snorkelers, but uh, they have pretty good data once again. Uh, so you can see out of the 95 patients that they have, uh, again, this was multi-centered with, with a variety of pathology, both dissections, residual dissections, aneurysms, and, and some others. And their stroke rate actually was fairly low. They did have endo leaks that were present. Um, so out of 95 patients, they had 10 endo leaks at the end of the index procedure. Uh, and half of those resolved within 30 days. I think, interestingly, it's fairly similar to the pattern of outcomes that we're seeing in the visceral segment for snorkeling. Uh, 
Uh, and their conclusion, obviously, is that they do fairly well with it. And the longer the snorkel zone is, or the interaction zone is between the parallel graphs, the, the fewer complications you have at later time points. So in summary, T-bar and the arch is definitely a field in evolution. It, a lot of us consider this sort of the last frontier that, that needs to be broken down. Hybrid techniques, particularly in the United States, are filling the void for now. It requires a lot of coordination between cardiac surgery, endovascular interventionalists, nursing, techs, anesthesia. It's a complicated process, but it certainly can and is being done. Strokes remain a formidable problem. And much like, it, in my, it, in the sense I have is this is a recapitulation of what happened with EVAR 20 years ago. Uh, technology is evolving very rapidly. Multiple companies are have multiple engineering designs. Physicians are bringing their own input into it. And I think the sense that we all have is that between physician and industry partnership, over the next five, 10 years, this problem will be solved, but it will take a lot of work by a 